Hello, everybody, and welcome to Open Source in Business. Uh, it's This is a speaker series that takes a broad view on the role of open source in industry. And uh, this week, I'm joined by Larry Gritz from Sony uh, Picture Imageworks and uh, uh, Carol Payne from Netflix. Uh, thank you for joining me. And we're going to talk about the ways that open source has transformed the film industry over the last 20 years or so. Um, so to get us started, Larry and Carol, uh, Larry, can you introduce yourself and explain a little bit of how you got into the film industry and, and how you got started on open source? Sure. Uh, my, my name is Larry Gritz. I am at Sony Pictures Imageworks, which is a, a small subsidiary of a subsidiary uh, of the big Sony. And we, we work on uh, visual effects and feature animation. Um, so we do a combination of the sort of live action you know, visual effects that you that you see, and also complete films, um, both for our own company, um, but also um, you know work for hire um, for other studios entirely. Um, I've been in the industry for uh, decades, <laughs> um, and I, I come from a traditional computer science background, um, but I, I'd always been really interested in uh, in film and photography, and you know somehow. The, the time that I was a PhD student, um, you know, digital computer graphics was really starting to become a thing. And those those lines just kind of converged in a way that, you know, propelled me forward. Carol? And and, and when I started, there was there was really not a lot of open source to speak of. Um, <laughs> but I, I you know maybe 10 years ago, the industry turned and I was kind of in the right place at the right time to, to have my hands in that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I am Carol Payne. I work for Netflix um, on our creative technology team. Uh, my background is uh, color science and imaging for visual effects. Um, and so, yeah, I came in through the visual effects industry and now I've worked at Netflix for two years. And uh, so many, we'll talk about it today, but yeah, so many of the tools that we use for me to be able to do my job have uh, are open source now in one way, shape or form. And um, it's gotten me very involved and uh, the opportunities within that are only growing. And so really excited to talk about my love for open source. I think <laughs> it's gonna, it's the future of our industry, so. Uh, and so you've been in the the industry, Carol, for about a, a decade, right? Not quite, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. so maybe uh, to take us on a, a, a kind of a little bit of a background of the evolution from, because I, I had a little bit of familiarity because I used to work on a project uh, which has been used in the film industry, Cinepaint or its, its uh, parent, the GNU Image Manipulation Program. I used to work on that project. That was the first open source project I worked on. And at the time, uh, which was right around 2000, the, the, the reputation was that like the film industry was all proprietary tools uh, that it was all proprietary hardware platforms. And then over the course of the next few years, it seems like a lot of the file formats and the tooling and the infrastructure that's used to render films has become open source dominated. Um, Larry, can you talk a little bit about the ev evolution in that period and how that how that change happened? Sure. So when I, when I started working professionally, the, the, the first film that I worked on for real was uh, was the first Toy Story movie. So this kind of dates me. Um, and in those days, we were all, you know, working on these uh, big, expensive SGI workstations. And uh, all of the software was either, you know, kind of early stage, very expensive commercial apps or custom tooling. You know, we all had big software departments and had to write things from scratch because there weren't even commercial apps at the time. And open source was kind of not on our our radar very much. Um, and towards the late 90s, as the 90s closed and the early 2000s started, there was a transition, um, you know, more towards, um, uh, you know, beefed up PCs as the basic hardware platform on people's desks. And with, you know, the, the, the graphics cards had come a long way, they were starting to get good enough uh, for us to use. Um, and, and of course, because we were all used to Unix varieties, um, we were running Linux on these machines. Um, so, so of course, with Linux introduced, you know, open source was something that we were at least all aware of and dependent on as users. And that was a that was a big foot in the door. But we, the visual effects specific software itself was mostly not um, until the the big breakthrough for us was in two thousand three, I believe, 
um, Industrial Light and Magic uh, open sourced a uh, project called OpenEXR. And that was a particular image file format that, that solved some uh, specific problems uh, for the industry uh, that the other formats uh, you know, didn't do. And, and instead of keeping that closed um, by open sourcing that, it, it actually became very widely used and embedded in um, all of the apps that we use. And, and, and that really set the stage for other people seeing, oh, like not only do we see that this is acceptable, but it's, it's a way for us to accomplish our goals by getting the technologies that we develop and we think is the right way to do something into all of the commercial apps that we use also. Because they're gonna, if you give them the, the piece that lets them implement what you want uh, as an open source project, They'll they'll use it if it's good. Um, so it's it's a it's a way to infiltrate those products as well. There was a there was a something you just we discussed when we were preparing this session as you met that you mentioned that I thought was really interesting was the way that um, the labor market around the film industry changed. Also, kind of activated and enabled uh, open source and and like file interchange as a key capability. Um, so can you talk about the way that you know technology? used to be a, a kind of a key differentiator between studios and how studios would make films from um, soup to nuts uh, yeah, to yeah. now different sections are being farmed out. Right, so so there, there's two interesting things that happened, um, you know, I would say mostly between 15 and, and 10 years ago. Um, one is the, the labor issue that you mentioned is that uh, you know the margins in this business are are small, uh, and so there was a big transition for most of the artists uh, working on the films. Um, you know, essentially being permanent hires to almost all of them across the industry being uh, hired for a particular show. And you know, when that show wraps, you hope there's another one coming up behind it, so you can just transfer them from one to the other. But that doesn't always happen, and so the labor force. Um, you know, started uh, to be much more about moving from company to company with each project, and you hope you always hope them, you get them back. And so that definitely set the stage for you know, there's a lot of overhead when someone comes in if you have to train them up on all these proprietary only tools, and then they leave and they kind of resent the fact that you've filled their heads, you know, with information they can't use anywhere else. Um, and so more reliance on both standardized commercial apps, but also on these open source projects kind of means a lot more people and knowledge portability from project to project and company to company, um, which is kind of necessary. Uh, and the other thing is like the, uh, the, the these big film projects themselves, it used to be more that a big facility like, like mine or like ILM um, would take on essentially an entire movie. Um, and that was that was pretty standard until about 10 years ago. And it's actually quite rare now. Even the big places, they might, instead of getting, you know, all 1,800 shots for a movie, they might get three or 400. And, but each of five big places will get three or 400. Um, and so be, part of that is because the production schedule is compressed and they're, they're doing this work in parallel at different facilities. Um, and so that means a lot more uh, collaboration is, is necessary. And so obviously you need to share files between different studios and, and that, that's where the open file formats kind mm -hmm. of came into their own, I guess, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, and, and I came in Carol, you've, uh, yeah, you've, you've worked on some of those file formats and I was, I was gonna... Yeah, yeah, that, that's a lot of time. Like when I came into the industry and started, I started as a, as a technical assistant at ILM and um, a lot of the stuff that we were doing at that time was developing pipelines around how do we how do we share files between vendors and even between like uh, subcontractors for a couple different things at ILM. You know, we would we would uh, we would uh, like send shots out for certain tasks and ingest them back in for others and and stuff like that. And it was a lot of the things that I was working on, and it's how I got introduced to Open Color IO, um, which is an open source project under the Academy Software Foundation. Um, because we had to have a way to send what is the color pipeline for this project out to companies um, and, and tell them what we'd done and what we did and how to replicate. Um, so that was a big one. Um, a lot of the other big ones on that ACES falls under that too, the Academy Color Encoding System, which is the other big open source project I work on. Um, but you have to have a way to say how this image is encoded and have different facilities and different programs know exactly what to do with that. Um, so it's between software packages and it's between different 
companies too. And so it's both of those things that intertwine mm -hmm. together. It's like that interoperability that becomes a big factor in why things, why open sources started to play a huge part. And so, uh, Carol, uh, you came into the digital media industry through a Bachelor of Fine Arts, as you mentioned, um, film and digital media. Can you talk a little bit about, like, were you introduced to open source tooling in college? Like, how has the, the training around uh, digital media evolved? Um, yeah, you know? it's funny because oh, I look back on it now, and, and yes, I was. You know, I was introduced to it in college, like things like using open source tools like Blender and uh, FFmpeg and OpenEXR and like and, and all of these things that that you you use in college and uh, you know my computer science classes they were they were running on Linux terminals uh, you know and things like that where yet you know, all of those things um, but it's interesting of like the, the education factor around what is open source and why is it so important and what are you when you're using this these tools what's actually different about them than a piece of software that you buy or a piece of like those things that wasn't that concept wasn't something that i was educated around or that became clear to me until i started working in the industry and you start to deal with um the differences between that and why when one is valued and benefits over the other um and to start to really make those connections about how the ecosystem actually works mm -hmm. that knowledge didn't come until until later, but yeah, I was messing around with FFmpeg and, and, you know, I just thought it was cool that I could get the stuff for free and play around with it. <laughs> and yeah. there was no, there was no connection about why that was the case until, until I was actually working in the industry. So you mentioned the Academy Software Foundation. Um, so I came across, you know, open source and film through essentially through the Academy, Academy Software Foundation, which I think started two, three years ago. Yeah. But the Academy has been been doing a lot um, around organizing open source projects for a, for quite a while. Larry, can you talk about like how the industry organized itself around open source uh, right. and open source efforts over the last few years? Yeah. So just um, you know, you know, just to, to clarify terminology, like this is the same Academy when we talk about the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the people that hand out the Oscars, and you know, um, um, people not in the industry you know, think of them only as like, okay, they're giving awards to actors or whatever. But uh, the sciences part has always been important to them also. So there's a science and technology council. They do a lot of work uh, in, you know, areas from um, sort of film preservation um, to, uh, you know, underlying technology, setting standards. Um, and and one thing they did as the, as the industry began to get critically um, dependent on these open source packages, um, th there was sort of a recognition of doing some investigation into like, just how just how deep, you know, embedded are we? Uh, and what's the risk profile of that, right? Because um, we already had a couple of cases where um, some particular packages became pervasively used critically, in, you know, critical infrastructure for a lot of these studios. And then maybe the company uh, that started them you know, didn't have the resources to put on it that it once did, or the founder of that project, you know, the main developer left the industry or wanted to work on something else. And suddenly that was no longer just a risk to the one company developing that software, like it would be if it was an internal project, but suddenly everyone's sharing the risk. So there was this idea that maybe as an industry, <laughs> we should, you know, convene a group to look and see like, how big is this problem? And do we need to find some other way to ensure that these projects have a, a long lasting home and good support. Um, and in the process of that investigation that lasted a couple of years, they decided to, um, to make a, a software foundation and that was a collaboration between the Academy and the Linux Foundation. Uh, and so the, the, the Academy Software Foundation is, is uh, two or three years old now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's both new, but it's also had so much traction in the industry that we, we can't even imagine living without it at this point. Um, and so it has become the home for a lot of these foundational uh, projects and a, a basis for just a ton of, of collaboration, uh, both in terms of the code and other things um, between all these companies that used to not talk to each other too much. And now we have this way to, um, to do things that benefit the whole group, which is great. Thank you. Um, 
it's uh, one of the things that you mentioned is that um like the academy software foundation part of the reason why it was created was risk mitigation around uh you know single points of failure on vendors how are like projects like open exr have been around for you know 15 over 15 years mm -hmm. prior to the asf you know how how was that how did people work together on the software was it was it run by single studios or did people not work together was all of the burden being taken by one vendor what's how did that work yeah, yeah they, it was pretty it was it was it was pretty single single source right so even if the project was open source um, a lot of these projects were started by a single studio um, whether or not they were open source from the beginning or not it, it doesn't really matter but a lot of the time um, before the academy software foundation uh, they were run by that single studio by engineers and and people in that studio there are a couple exceptions um and and as time goes on things change like ilm did the initial open source of open exr and then there was substantial contributions a while after from weta digital um that that you know have that started a lot of that collaboration but it very it does vary and they do kind of tend to stay in their home studio mm -hmm. In almost all of these projects, that, like they were always open to outside contribution, and in some cases, in practice, took them. But they tended to be like they were regarded as still um, being run, you know, and managed by its original sponsor and home, and, and usually lived in that company's, um, you know, GitHub accounts. So it was it was pretty clear like who it belonged to in some sense. Right. Uh, and the the big change with the ASWF is now there's a neutral home for these. And a lot of these have made the transition to, to truly being a, an industry-wide collaborative project where there's there is no there's no one clearly in charge. I mean the group the group chooses their leaders, but it's not like one company and you know it and it doesn't stick with them. It, it's it's a much more collaborative um, endeavor than it was even when they were open before. Like it's a whole new level now, um, just in the past couple of years. And was that something that was consciously um, part of the bootstrapping of the Apache Software Fund, or not Apache <laughs> Academy Software Foundation? Excuse, excuse me, slip of the mind, slip of the tongue. Yeah, I, I mean, part of their mission statement was, you know, like make make a neutral home for these. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't, you know, I don't feel like we knew at the time just how far it was going to go. Like I think it happened very organically. But now it almost seems like. We can't imagine it any other way. Like it, it's quite common now. Like there are these working groups that they have, where even without a project, um, there's some topic that we know, it, you know, is of technical importance to everyone, and we'll get people together through the foundation to kind of start mulling over. Like, does there need to be a project? Like, is this a problem we all have, and we shouldn't all go off and solve it ourselves? We should do something together so that it's not all, you know, everyone's burden redundantly. Um, right. And it, it's just become much more not just accepted but like almost the default is like hey let's see if this is something where we can do it together instead of shouldering the entire cost ourselves um you know and and that's it has just become much closer to the central way of thinking about some of these projects i mean not everything like a lot of the we still do a ton of custom custom software development there are a lot of things that are not appropriate to open source and the main reason is just that a lot of the custom development we have is just stuff that's so particular to our way of doing things or other pieces of our pipeline that it, it almost wouldn't be valuable to anyone else. It's not worth the trouble. But but sometimes we recognize things as like, oh, I know my place has to solve this problem, but also ILM has to solve the problem and Netflix has to solve the problem and Disney has to solve the problem. Let's like, it's silly to all do it separately. Like, let, let's just talk about it. Another thing I thought was interesting when we were talking about this is that like, um, ASWF is not just about technical collaboration, as you mentioned, but it's even it even goes beyond, um, you know, industry wide technical issues to some industry wide structural issues. Which Carol, I think, it brings us on nicely into one of one of the things that you're working on in in, in uh, the Software Foundation, which is uh, diversity and inclusion, which is which is something that's been kind of front of mind in the film industry as well as in open source for a long time. Yeah, it's it's a really I feel like a, a confluence of of many opportunities uh, when we've got this this foundation that you know is prioritizing a lot of you know open collaboration and things in a lot of ways and um, they got started and then a, a year or so in um, the the topic came up of you know how what could we be doing 
to uh, basically make the, make this more inclusive for folks around the world and um, encourage new con- new contributions because honestly when we look around uh, the film industry and we look around open source um, software development the demographics are still very shockingly similar um, or not so shockingly similar I guess when you think about it it's like open source should be open and it should be open to anybody and anybody should be able to contribute but when you look at the demographics of people that are contributing it is still predominantly you know predominantly white predominantly male um, and uh, so when you look at that, you're like, okay, well, something is not happening correctly. There's systemic issues here, just like there are anywhere else, even though theoretically anyone can join. So we're looking at with the diver- diversity inclusion group, working group, like Larry mentioned in the Software Foundation, we have working groups that aren't attached to specific projects that have tasks. And one of those for us is diversity and inclusion. And I co-lead that group with uh, my colleague, my old colleague from ILM, Rachel Rose. Um, who is incredible. And we have, we've got a great group of people. We've been working for not quite a year now um, on a lot of initiatives, um, both internal to the Academy Software Foundation and the things like, how do, how do we as a foundation operate? Are we, are, are we structurally set up for, to be the best inclusive um, place that we can be from, from how we form our leadership teams to, um, our our documentation within our projects and within the foundation, um, the onboarding process, how easy is it to start contributing to one of these projects? Um, we'll be continually working on that for a long time. And then the other side of it is the external outreach of, okay, so we're not having, you know, a, di- a diverse uh, group of people coming in and starting to contribute to these projects. Why? How can we outreach? How can we start to look at making, uh, the work that we're doing more well known and more accessible to different groups of people. Um, so we're doing some education outreach in the form of career webinars of like, here are all the technical careers that uh, exist in the media and entertainment industry um, and why they're cool and how your computer science degree or your film degree or your en- any type of engineering degree is 100% applicable. It's also applicable if you don't have a degree and you want to learn something new there's there's so many ways to 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 find something new that you're interested in and to learn about it um and open source and contributing to open source projects is a huge way that um we would love to see utilized more because it's a lot too about once you get in and start contributing to these projects especially in the academy software foundation currently it's made up of all the top people in the industry working on these projects and you get so much exposure and uh, mentorship opportunities and just the, you know, opportunity to figure out and learn um, from people that have been like Larry, that have been doing this for a long time um, and want to share knowledge and want to build the team so that we don't have, you know, the, 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 you know, the second part of it is, yeah, now we're in the software foundation, but the second part of this now too is growing that base of contributors so that we still don't run into the, oh my gosh, what do we do when someone that's working on one of these tools moves industries? Because it still is hmm. a thing that um, we have to deal with. So, and, and even outside open source, you know, per se, like we are always hungry to hire talented people, and we are in competition, um, you know, almost almost less with each other than we are collectively, uh, you know, to hire people into the technical parts of the film industry versus, you know, going to work for a bank or, you know, Facebook or what, right? Like we're, we're competing with the whole tech industry too um, for the same talent. And, you know, if we look around and say like, you know, how, how can we, um, you know, pull people in that are really talented. And if we look at the pool and say like, hey, you know, like this doesn't look like the demographics of the world. That means, you know, somebody talented that we should be hiring like they've been filtered out before they get to us and and we don't want that right so what can we do is sort of pull in all of the challenged people um including from the the corners that may have been overlooked uh before because um we you know we've got no shortage of of work to do for them that was actually gonna like that's connected to uh, something that you you mentioned that you're looking for contributors to projects i was wondering if you were looking more broadly for people to get into the film industry 
yeah. uh, starting even like do you focus on using tools versus contributing to tools is do you do training sessions around you know building up a portfolio of work on say blender is a project you mentioned earlier uh to kind of showcase talents or is that kind of out of scope for you right now right right now it's out of scope um we're just getting started you know we have a lot of a lot of things we would love to do um and obviously some, some trainings and things like that we we do have a couple programs like one of the things we're launching this summer um is a, a what we're calling our scholarship program where we're going to let uh people who want to learn these skills apply for grants that will go towards online classes in a subject of related to the film and media industry hopefully of their choice so that they can start, you know, take that. There's tons of great online classes out there that are accessible wherever you are in the globe, um, and uh, that will accompany. That'll be accompanied with a mentor from someone that works in the Academy Software uh, and Academy Sof Software Foundation project in some capacity hmm. um, to be there as a resource, not necessarily a, a technical resource to help you with your class because that's going to be all over the place, but a person to talk to that you can ask questions about your career development and and what you're doing and what you're looking to achieve is more the type of mentorship we're talking about. Um, so that's something we're doing because we don't have the resources uh, or, or you know the ability. People have done it better before us of how to use Blender um, right. and how to you know those types of things. So um, using our resources wisely because at the end of the day, our first focus is our the projects within the Software Foundation and getting a solid base there because at the end of the day we're at, we're a technical software development foundation. So we want to we want to be smart about about uh, what we are good at and then use other resources for the for the rest and make those connections. And a lot of that is just the connection building. Right. There's a there's a strong, you know, window into the parts of these film companies that are solving the really technical problems and doing the software development. You know, it's probably outside of our scope <laughs> to be recruiting people for the artists departments. And they have well established pipelines for that as well. And that that's not going to be our strength, at least through the the Academy Software Foundation. Um, but yeah, on the technical side, you know, I, I, one, of, one of the things I, that I especially like about these projects for, for recruiting is, you know, you see how people work and interact and uh, take criticism with code reviews and things, you know, I can learn so much more about someone um, interacting with one of these projects than I could from an interview. And we do, we do, we have hired people who came to our attention you know, solely because they made interesting contributions to open source projects that we care about. And like, we've seen their work products, <laughs> like it's kind of a no brainer that, that that's the person that you want to hire versus, you know, some un unknown person where you're, you're sort of trying to suss out, like, what are they like, you know, from a, a few interviews or, you know, it, it's just so much better. You see their work. Um, so it's, it, it's a great, it's a great way to, uh, to recruit in that sense. And um, so, I just want to point out that uh, Jonas uh, put a link to a list of 280, more than 280 open source projects used in the creative industry. Um, and I'm going to ask one of his questions. Um, so specifically, how are companies working together to develop a project in common? Uh, are there R&D teams sharing knowledge openly in the public? Or is it more about, you know, you use a project, a company, a, you use a, I'm, this is me ad living, but uh, you, you pick a project that nearly does what you want, and then you add a feature to do what you actually want for a specific film, and then that gets contributed back. Like, how how does that contribution process work? It's both. It's all of the above. Um, I, I, you know, so yes, to answer the question of like, are we openly like the 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 open source and open source is is the is the key so the companies that are that are working on these and using them and deciding have to make a conscious contrib decision to contribute this back out openly under uh, you know under what uh, the open source licensing structure that says anybody can use this and i can't you know i can't put any limitations on that basically um so that part is there and that includes you know the the collaboration that comes along with like how we think about thought processes and um the meetings that we have um and uh you know the meeting notes are all publicly available um the discuss the meetings are open to anyone um you can come and join them whenever you want um and, and that's a really important part of of what we're doing and the, and the decisions that you make as an individual if you're not working for a company 
and as as a company that has decided to contribute to open source software. Yeah, the the I'll just echo what Carol Carol said about that. There's a range of of how we interact with these projects. You know, all the way from it's fine out of the box, and we use an open source project um, like we use with a commercial app, and and that's that. Nothing ever needs to be changed. And there are some where occasionally we'll see some way to make it better or to fix something, and we don't you know want to wait for the next version and we'll fix it and contribute the fix back. Um, but there are some where like we're the uh, in the origin of the project, you know, either with one company or several of us collaboratively, it's constant active development. People work on it full time, um, you know, and, and the organization varies from project to project. One thing that the Academy Software Foundation has brought to the table is, is just really good organization and, 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 and sort of another level of op openness, um, you know, where the projects that have been adopted by the foundation, um, they have formal uh, steering committees um, and they have, you know, Zoom meetings on a regular basis to talk about the development plan and, and what they're doing. And they have, you know, elected, uh, you know, chairs and and sometimes uh, chief architects and, and other positions. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it it's very much works like a like a little bit like a software company, except that people aren't all employed by the same company. Um, maybe, maybe Carol wants to talk a little bit about how Open Color IO um, works, just sort of like how, how the project dynamics worked, because I think that's one of the projects where it's kind of the most collaborative and 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 has people um, from from uh, from several companies all working together. Yeah, Open Color IO has been has been quite quite the journey. Uh, you know, it was originally uh, developed, Larry is well aware, at, at Sony Pictures Image Works and open source while it was there and hosted there um, and then transferred to the Academy Software Foundation and released a version one. Um, I forget exactly when it was, it's been a while. Um, but since then, the project has, you know, kind of been a little, it had been up until about four years ago, a little dormant. Um, and so the first version was incredibly useful and it took a long time to get a lot of industry software and the industry houses using open color IO in general. And so there was a, there was a big transition period to using that as a way to describe your color pipeline. Um, but it became to the point it was pretty ubiquitous. And then people, we started noticing, I, there are some features that are missing, um, such as in the version one, a, a match between what you see in a CPU pipe based pipeline versus a GPU based pipeline. The GPU is limited in a couple different ways that was pretty obvious. Um, and so we started looking at these things and um, Autodesk in particular was a company that was really looking at open color IO as, you know, having, they were having to support their own proprietary color solution um, in their, in their software packages like Maya and flame and a couple others. Um, and then they were also supporting open color IO because of industry needs um, and the need to, to be interoperable between a couple things. And it get that gets to be hard. And at some point, you know, you start to make a decision and, and a couple companies have done this. Um, Nuke over the years did the foundry is another example that's like had their own proprietary way of dealing with color and now supports open color IO. Um, and so you start to look at these things and Autodesk made a decision to, to go all in on open color IO. And so devoted a bunch of, a couple engineers, three full-time engineers to um, working towards a version two of open color IO um, that like three, three, four years ago. Now it's been a long, it's been a really long effort. Um, and over the years, especially since the transfer and the start of the Academy Software Foundation, there's been an added on of a bunch of different companies jumping on um, to support those development efforts that were led um, by Autodesk. They've done a ton of work. Um, but companies like, you know, uh, Imageworks still plays a big part. Um, Netflix, my company, has jumped on board. ILM is on board. Um, Weta Digital um, has jumped on and is, is contributing a lot of uh, things specifically, like uh, how we handle uh, basic con OCIO config generation of like, okay, so you have this library, but now, how do you how do you use it, and what are what are the baselines that people can jump off from? Um, so there's lots of inroads of different people contributing to these projects, and it's been really cool to see all of that come together and happen in a way um, that you know was kind of unheard of five years ago. 
and um, it's resulted in the release of OCIO v2 uh, in January. Um, and we still have tons of work to do in getting it into software, and um, there's always going to be work to do. But it was a really like multi-company global effort to get it over the finish line. Yeah. Um, on, on, on Open Color IO, also, it's not just the studios that are collaborating on this, but several of the software vendors who are competing with each other and sort of angling to like sell us stuff. Um, like they're, like yeah. they're basically just all, we made this space where everyone can get together and solve this big technical problem. And then that solution is going to go into all of these projects, uh, it, it, both the commercial products and the, you know, the studio written you know, custom tools just so that it works, you know, uniformly across all of those. And it just it just solves a, a ton of problems for everyone that way. That's one of the things that's been interesting to me learning about this, uh, the way the film industry has developed is that, uh, and you mentioned this uh, in prep, is, is that you still have proprietary in-house and open source uh, development. And they're actually even kind of intermixing a little bit. And you're seeing um, proprietary companies adopting open source libraries for certain file formats or certain parts of their pipeline. Um, can you talk a little bit about about how, uh, and I think this goes to the, the other question that Jonas asked is, like, how do you make those decisions around uh, which to use, build versus buy versus share or develop or however you want to talk about adopting an open source component? Yeah, I mean, it's on a case by case basis, you know, if there's I mean, human human time is the scarce resource in many ways. So if there is an affordable off the shelf solution that does what we want, like we're happy to buy products like that's, you know, we use a lot of commercial apps and we use, and not just one, but I mean, <laughs> kind of all, all of them. And um, which is part of what makes the need to have to be able to ship data, you know, out of one app and into another uh, back and forth across several stages of, of production. Even even if we weren't collaborating with other studios, there's that need to bridge different products from different vendors, and that's part of why a lot of these, you know, standard formats and libraries are are really helpful. Um, there are, yeah, I mean, we we look at each case individually in terms of should we open source this project, um, and it, it's you know there's a bunch of factors like it's very the interesting thing though is if you'd asked us all you know ten years ago, we would have guessed you know, a lot of the time the answer would be no, because it's some secret piece of technology. We don't want our competitors to have this. And that used to be a little more true in the early days. And I, we came to the realization that that's not really the battlefield that we're competing on at all um, to get these projects. Like there's, you can't, like, I wish the, pro the software I worked on was so important that we're winning and losing, you know, $30 million you know, film deals because of, you know, these lines of code. And that's just not how it works. It's it's infrastructure that we need to do the films, but that's not the thing that lets us, that, that makes or breaks whether we get the contracts. And, and so that kind of opens the door to think more creatively about how do we use the scarce development resources that we have? And like I said before, like a lot of the custom development we do, wouldn't do anybody else any good to have. Um, because it's just so particular to our way of working and other, it's got tendrils into other parts of our pipeline. It's impossible to separate out. And it would, it would be so much work to make it into the kind of general shape that would be useful to other people. It, it, it just isn't, it, you know, we can't see any re return on that investment. Right. But then there are other projects where we, we just know like, oh, even in this form, you know, it will be useful to other people, but also it will be more useful to us if we have that injection of other of ideas and expertise and use cases from other other places. Like, you know, it might be that Netflix needs to use a piece of software in a way that hasn't occurred to us yet, <laughs> but by having them collaborate with us, even if they can't contribute the code uh, uh, by be, by using it and filing issues and participating in the steering of it, um, that may get us out ahead of a problem that if they're facing it now, maybe we will in a couple of years. Um, and, and that tends to make the software a lot stronger. And so we're just, we're on the lookout for projects that have those kinds of synergies. They, they don't all, most of them don't. Yeah. But the ones that do, we try to really jump on. I think it's important to recognize that, you know, open sourcing software isn't cost-free, right? It's not just a case of putting the source code out there and 
and magic will happen. That that creating a, a community or creating like a successful open source project does involve an investment of time and energy. Yeah. And you'll, you'll also notice a lot of the successful open source projects in our industry, their their file formats, their core libraries, their computational things, uh, right. their rarely end user facing apps with GUIs and stuff because uh, first of all like supporting you know end user artists is a lot harder um, than making a tool for other developers um, but also the studios tend to be really particular about exactly what sits in front of the artists and and doing everything the way they want it's just it's harder to make everybody happy with a with an artist facing app than it is with a you know a library that the, the developers in the other companies will know exactly how to use, but they don't necessarily they'll they'll reskin it um, to expose it to their artists, um, but it's it's harder to do that. And that's true for software released by studios, but it's not necessarily true for open source in general. There are open source and user facing applications. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah it it kind of it sort of depends like you start to see these commonalities and these connection points between a lot of these, this work in particularly in the film and, and media industries of things that you, that everybody has to do and capitalize on those things and, and try and like Larry was saying, look out ahead to things that, you know, we, we might not have thought of. And that's where a lot of this stuff um, kind of, kind of comes and then and empowering a lot of it for working for a big studio. Like a lot of it is about empowering people to do the work without having to fight the technology so much and, and spend their resources um, redoing it every project or when a new thing, version of a software comes out or, or, or so, something like that, that like disrupts the, the way that they need to work would rather them spend their resources on what makes them special, which is how right. they do their work. And, and you know, the work that you produce um, and the content that you're creating. Um, it, it, there's there is a there is kind of a line that is becoming clear as we start to move along this open source road of how can what what makes sense to be to have everyone do on on a on at least a starting baseline of the same and where you go from that is what makes your work shine you know but there were like in the past there would have been studios who they were the best ones at say fire or water or hair or fur or whatever it is is that no longer the case are, are, are those kind of or are those still that's different? certainly still still true and that's part of that's part of how we do get work is is the you know the track record of the films we work on and different studios are known for different things you know some some might be the best at you know giant robots, you know, destroying buildings, uh, you know, a different one will do, you know, character animation, um, you know, like, like they do have their specialties and that is part of how we get the work. Um, and yeah, so that, that, that continues like there are, but a lot, a lot of that is because of, of the custom software and a lot of the, but more of it is just because of the, the expertise and the pipeline. It's the, the processes, the, you know, the, what, people we've hired and what they're good at, what as a company we've learned to be able to execute well on, you know, you can't be good at everything. Um, and, and, and those things, uh, those things rarely boil down to, you know, using a particular library, like it's just vastly more complicated than that. So the, the, you know, the infrastructure um, is, is much more in, interchangeable, uh, but that doesn't mean that everybody is equally good at different types of high level work. So I do want to go back to uh, at, at, um, diversity and inclusion for just one more um, question, which is um, you mentioned a lot about all of the meetings are in public. Uh, you know, you have Zoom meetings where anybody's welcome to participate, et cetera. Um, are you are you also working as a as a foundation to um, to enable people to contribute from different time zones with different languages? Without access to technology, without access to the you know the real time Zoom meetings and you know working on volunteer time, or is that something that's not front of mind right now? I, I mean, I think it it depends on it, the state of um, where each project is at. You'll see diff you'll see different levels of um, of need based on based on the pro. Some projects are, you know, they're just at different stages in development, and and so I think that makes a big difference. Um, so. The Academy Software Foundation and the Linux Foundation, in particular, has a lot of great, you know, baseline standards of of 
accessibility and, and equity and things like that as far as like how the meetings are structured and where the notes are kept and, and things like that. And beyond that, um, we do try to be uh, as time zone friendly as, as we can. Um, it, it's hard. I mean, especially it's been really funny the last couple, you know, it's, it happens once a year, you know, around this time, it, well, twice a year, I guess, actually. Daylight savings is <laughs> makes everybody's life very, very hard. We just had this discussion in the Open Colorado uh, steering committee meeting again, like New Zealand just changed and made everything difficult again. Um, so it's constant, but the work is there. The acknowledgement is there. I think um, language is, is, a, is a thing that, I would like to start looking more heavily at in the future. Um, everything is primarily because software development is just primarily English based to to the vast majority. But you know, as we start to be more globalized and um, making this uh, open and accessible, having at least you know documentation for things available um, and, and having some some ways to localize that too. I mean, you can kind of do it in browser, sort of, but having more um, intentionality around that, I think is is definitely something I see in the future of, that could be a really great addition. Okay. Um, how we deal with that, we have, you know, uh, it, it is it is a process and we are only getting started. Yeah. I mean, as far as the as far as the meetings go, like we do schedule them to try to accommodate people. <laughs> like there's usually people from Asia Pacific as well as Europe and North America on these calls. So they tend to be at clustered in a certain time of day where like it's early morning for some and late night for others in the middle of the day. Um, but at least everyone can kind of make it without too much inconvenience. And and the calls, um, the calls are more for the project leadership. Um, lots of people contribute to these projects and have never been on one of the calls. It's it's all done through GitHub, you know, right. you, it, it mail lists and Slack and that sort of thing. So that's that's really not an impediment time zone wise. I mean, language wise, it's certainly all English, but like it's, you know, film and tech, like it's like that, right? Like if yep. you go to a visual effects studio anywhere in the world, doesn't matter which country it is, um, you know, they're speaking English at work. <laughs> Um, that, that's just like a fact. So, um, but I think a, a bigger hurdle is that many of these projects are are really uh, arcane, uh, you know, technical areas. Um, it's it's the 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 bigger threshold is like most people have no need for color science, you know, in their life if they're not dealing with the you know these kind of media problems. And so, you know, like there are many open source projects out there in the world where like. Anybody who uses a computer knows what that project is for, and if they have again to participate, they kind of have the background, you know, as a human, to to know what the project's about and find some way that it's relevant to their life. That is a challenge um, for some of our projects, which are very specific to the way professionals do a particular thing in this industry, and is it can be hard to explain. Uh, maybe not not so hard to explain, but like I, my like my feeling is the best open source contributions come from people who have a stake in using it or foreseeing how it fits into their life, and that motivates them to want to improve it. Like it's not we're not going to pay them, you know. Like I mean, unless they're working at one of the studios, but like it's you know, like you have to feel motivated in the sense of like I see how this thing is a benefit. Um, and and so if it's if it's just an abstract piece of software that like some other industry uses and and you don't see how it fits into your life, I think that's a a really high bar to clear. Yeah, it's uh, you mentioned color, and it, it's just one of my. I, I started an event a few years ago called the Libra Graphics Meeting, and one of the topics that was in the very first uh, edition of that was a was a, a, a lecture on color. Uh, it was. Awesome. It's one of my all time favorite. I did not realize there was so much in it. It's one of those areas that I'm really glad that there are color scientists out there like Carol, because as soon as I start to open the box, I realize just how wrong I am about, about most of my intuition about it. Um, it you know, it, it, it's funny that you mentioned other other projects. So interestingly, um, in, in ways people not right may not realize, like a lot of, you know, students or casual users using some of the bigger open source projects like um i don't know if it's in gimp yet or not it might be certainly in blender well, let's pick ben blender as an example blender has open color io in it it's got open color io concepts you know throughout at this point 
um, the uh, the shading language is is OSL, uh, you know, open shading languages, which is an academy um, project at this point. Um, it, it, it uses OpenEXR as a file format. It like it probably incorporates most of our projects, you know, in a hidden way that maybe casual users don't use. But that's another yeah. way that maybe like if they're already using that package, um, like it does have relevance to their life, and they can sort of see how the pieces all all fit together. Right. Yeah, and we need we need users. Like that's a really great point. Is we need users of this stuff because what, as developers, as the developers of these projects, we need testers. We need people to 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 put it through its paces and to find issues. And that's a really great way to get into the project and get familiar with with these things of like starting to realize. Yeah, I've used Blender for years, but I didn't know that it was backed by Open Color IO. But then you start to get involved in the project, and we release a new version. And you find all these things that change and then to have that knowledge and make that connection that you can go back to talk to these developers about this stuff and it's open source and start to learn about the project and why it functions, why it's doing what it's doing and why we changed something. And, um, you know, all of those things is, is a, is a great way in. Cause like, yeah, like Larry said, without context, a lot of these things just that you don't even, it's hard to grok. You can't even, <laughs> you have to see it working to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, what and then that touches on something that you also discussed in in prep is that a lot of these projects really, really value contributions that are not code contributions, and I think both of you have a great example um, around product management and giving kind of defining features and roadmaps. And and Larry, you mentioned documentation uh, in prep. Can you can you talk about some of the ways that that like projects really value non-code contributions. Maybe Carol, oh, start with yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I think like Larry, Larry talks about a bunch, but there, I mean, there's a couple. I mean, non-code uh, can can be the diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, it, can, it but it also in like a little bit more like things that are happening right now is is that documentation efforts across across the software foundation. We just overhauled uh, Open Color IO's documentation. And it was a subgroup of us working within the, the development community of Open Color IO that, you know, a bunch of not software engineers, a bunch of users of Open Color IO, and then also working together with the software engineers to come up with a way to uh, revamp the documentation, both from a technical standpoint of how it's generated, auto generated from the C headers through to the Python bindings, through to, you know, the, the, how, it's, how it's on the web. Um, but also what is the content of that documentation and how does it flow and how is it best presented to a user who's looking at this for the first time and that kind of stuff. Um, someone as a developer that's really, really close to the code base can be really challenging to look at with fresh eyes of like what's missing and um, what doesn't make sense because we've used it for so long. Um, and so having fresh eyes on that and people that aren't developers was something we looked for. We, we we reached pretty far out into like our networks of people and, and pulled people in um, to have a look at it and to 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 give us feedback. Um, and that's ongoing always. Yeah. So. And also, you know, someone designed your logo and someone made the style guide for the website and made, made beautiful web pages out of it. And you know, somebody you, you know, like there there are so many things that the projects can use that give it that level of polish and completeness as a as a product um, that is so much more than you know writing lines of code. And it, it in some ways it's it's harder to find those contributors. Um, but they're equally, you know, valuable in terms of making it a, a good ongoing project that gets adoption in the places that we want to see it go. I mean, like we, 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 it's not a commercial enterprise, but like we have to to be successful. We we need to treat it as if it were a product. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, so I'd like to thank you both for joining me. Um, before we sign off, is there anything else that you would like to add uh, today in terms of uh, uh, something that you, you feel is important that we haven't touched on, uh, either of you? We covered a lot of bases. I, I would love to emphasize again, um, a good jumping off point to learn more about this is the aswf.io uh, website. That's the, the foundation's website. You can get links to the projects 
And in particular, there's this landscape.aswf.io that's got not just the projects in the foundation, but it's, it's a little bit more of a map of the major open source projects used by the film industry. Uh, it's a, just a good place to see kind of the survey of like what's out there that we're using. Which Carol linked to over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's in, in the chat. Um, yeah, I think I would echo this, the same thing too. Um, and feel free to, there's, like Larry said, there's lots of like asynchronous ways to communicate with us too. So don't be uh, afraid to jump on our Slack channel and and say hello and ask questions of a follow up that is linked out on the ASWF website. Um, there's also mailing lists for individual decks um, if you prefer to just like get information sent to you to consume or ask questions that way. Um, is a great like a couple of those are are pretty active. Um, not some more than others, you know, just depends. And uh, I think, yeah, I, I, you know, if you're at all interested, jump on those channels and, and say hello. But really just like, if there's anything you take away from this, it's really just that open source is, is, is here to stay um, and no longer, you know, a second class citizen um, in the world of uh, media and entertainment. And I think it's, that, it's, it's here to stay. And so as far as like, if you're looking for an area to get involved, there's in my opinion, nothing better. Thank you. So next week, we change tack. Next week, I have uh, two people from the venture capital industry. Uh, I'm joined by Astasia Myers and Imran Ghori. And we're going to talk a little bit about venture capital and open source, which I hope will touch on um, what types of companies are interesting for venture capital investment, uh, the ways in which venture capital can help open source projects succeed. Uh, I'm also interested in some of the ways that uh, you know some open source projects do not benefit from venture capital and 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 the ways in which uh, market dynamics and expectations of invest of investors can can actually damage um, some projects or companies. So I, hopefully it will be an interesting conversation, and I look forward to seeing uh, many as many of you as possible there next week. Um, Carol, Larry. Thank you very much for joining me today. This was a, a pleasure. And you, uh, it's, I mean, this is this is a, an amazing industry. Um, and it's it's uh, seeing the way that uh, things have changed in this industry in the last 20 years has been really astounding. Uh, so it's a it's another great example of how open source can serve beyond the, you know, the the software industry, I guess, is uh, is one way to put it. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.